Who is your Mount Rushmore of professional wrestlers? Steve Austin, Undertaker, Ric Flair, Hogan. According to rumors, nails choke and hurt Vince McMahon? I was right there. He had Vince up against the wall. And if it hadn't been for Flaw to being in there or close by, he would have messed Vince up. After that, Vince was never alone. When Steve Austin gets dropped on his head, what are you doing in the ring? After that bump, I said, Owen, please, trip over him. Let him roll you up. Don't kick out because he's hurt. What's going on, wrestling fans? It is I, Steve Ball, and welcome to Tank Out right here at Wrestling News Co. On today's edition, I am talking to the GOAT of professional wrestling referees. It is Earl Hebner. Earl, how are you doing today? Hey, bud. Great, great. It is so good to have you back. Oh, it's a pleasure. Come on in. I'm so happy. You, I see your book there, your action figures. I have the book right here, and it is amazing. It is filled with so many... Funny, hilarious stories about the, wor the world of professional wrestling. But before we get into this book, I do have a question for you. Before it kicked off last time with Mount Rushmore of wrestling, and, you know, we didn't really get into it. I want to know, who is your Mount Rushmore of professional wrestlers? Uh, <clears throat> why do you ask me all these hard questions? <laughs> That's my job, I guess. I've been around these guys all my life, and it's hard for me to pick one individual. Four. You got to pick four, my friend. Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. Undertaker. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rick Flair. He's my hero. Yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, Hogan. All right. But there I you go. The one, the one, you know? Well. It, 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 you know, if it was the endless uh, Mount Rushmore, we could sit here all day. Cause I agree. It's very hard, I think, to pick four individuals. What are we basing it off of? Money made, match quality, um, popularity. There's so many of them. But the ones you said, I 100% agree. If there's a Mount Rushmore, those people belong on that. But, you know, we are upon WrestleMania season. And you have been the referee for so many of those quality classic WrestleMania main events. And one of them really jumps out at me is WrestleMania 12. It's an Iron Man match for Hart for Shawn Michaels. They have to go an hour and you're the referee. Is this the longest match you've ever been involved with on television, on pay-per-view as well? And how do you prepare for something like this? Because this is going to go over an hour. Right. I was going to say, I think it went an hour and 10 minutes, something like that. <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a long match, and it's uh, you're working your butt off the whole. whole I mean, there's no rest, rest period, period. You know what I mean? So you're steady going up and down, up and down. It's it's hard. Now, as a referee as well, if you're going an hour long, now this is gonna get a little personal. As a referee, you're going, you know, many matches in a day. This is an hour long. Is there a moment where you're like, man, I really gotta use the bathroom? Well, you do all that before you go to the ring. You prepare yourself for that too, as well as the match. <laughs> you hope. You can only hope. Oh, man. Yeah. So going into that, are you backstage with Sean and Brent going over this all day long? Because this is going to go down as one of the longest WrestleMania matches of all time. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, a match like that, we go over it uh, three or four times before we get to the ring. You know, because there's a lot to remember. Of a lot, you know, an hour and ten minutes, a hour. It, it, it is a, a lot of work, a lot of things going on where you got to be, and you can't see, and you can see, and it's uh, it's tough. Was there can? But the thing is, like when I did that match, that's the only one I done because I got to be prepared. I got to be uh, up to par and. Uh, you know, when you do something like that, you just tell Vince that uh, it's all I can do is this. If I can get all this right in an hour, you should be happy. Right, of course. And uh, and then leading into this, is there contention between Brett and Sean? Because obviously, Sean is coming up. Brett is going to go off and do a TV show, Lonesome Dove. And yet, there's obviously always going to be the number one dog in the yard. What is the feeling 
uh, between Brett and Sean going into this, because obviously we talked about our last interview, Montreal is obviously 97. This is 96 March. So how are you, do you, are you reading the room? Are they working well together? They're doing okay, but uh, nobody wants to give and nobody wants to take. Right. That's basically it. Nobody wants to be outshowed, you know, out outdone and, and everything. It, uh, everybody wants to be a hero. Of course. Yeah. Uh, that match, though, forever long. Though other matches you were involved with, WrestleMania 7, Macho Man versus Ultimate Warrior. It's the career match. It's the match of the night, if you ever watch WrestleMania 7. And you're the referee for this as well. And I talked about this with you before, about how Macho Man was a perfectionist and Ultimate Warrior was a bit of a handful. So having them work together in a WrestleMania match, you're the referee, you're back there. What is the atmosphere like between these two men? Because Macho demands perfection and Warrior is a bit of a nut. Right. Uh, well... You can say that Randy gave me uh, a script probably thicker than my book. To really? Before the match. Way, way before uh, it even come up. I probably read it. I probably, I probably read it about maybe two weeks before the match. Because I had to deal with Randy, the ultra warrior. It was just a waste of time me sitting with him trying to get stuff out of him away with going or what he's doing because he never even knew what, what direction he was going in. So it was basically me and Randy lead that match. So after the match, I imagine maybe there's some uh, celebrations because that's the night we have Miss Elizabeth reunite with the Macho Man. She, you know, there's a whole new ball game for Macho Man on television. But what is the feeling backstage? Because you read that, you read that giant book of how this match was going to go. Did it go the way Macho Man wanted to go, and did he give Warrior any lip after it? No, uh, I guess I would say it went ninety percent right. There was a few screw ups here and there, but not because Randy or myself. So, and it was not nothing said after the match because it wouldn't have done any good. It, 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 the match was done and over. It it was it is what it was, and and uh, if they probably talked it over afterwards, it, it probably a little bit of a real fight. Oh no! What? Because I'm imagining before they work at a big main event match like WrestleMania Seven, they're gonna be involved on the house show loops as well, and possibly. So, it, it, again, you're backstage. Is there an atmosphere of someone doesn't want to budge? Anyway, which way? They both want to look strong, but also Macho Man laid in three of his finisher elbow drops on the top rope and Warrior still pinned him with his foot. Was that by design, by what you're going by this manuscript you're reading? One right. foot to pin him in three elbows? Right. Yeah. Warrior uh, wanted to be uh, the strong man. So you you have to give and take. So if you want me to take three elbows in the fourth when you pin me, then I'm going to kick out of the, the three before I'll get there, before you get there. You know, that's, uh, that's being selfish. Yeah, because even go to the next pay-per-view, SummerSlam 91, Ultra Warrior ends up holding up Vince McMahon for money because he wants the same amount as Hulk Hogan. And so he gets fired immediately after... SummerSlam 91. And just on the last pay-per-view, WrestleMania 7 we're talking about, Macho Man retires. He does come back at the end of the year, but he retires. Was that the right decision? Because Warrior is gone a few months later as well. I think Brandon was sort of burnt out. He needed a break. You know? Makes sense. Yeah, the road is, is obviously a tough one. Though, uh, continuing their amazing uh, WrestleMania matches, WrestleMania 17. Referee for The Rock versus Stone Cold. And this is arguably the greatest WrestleMania of all time. And you are the referee for the main event. Now, at the end of this, Vince McMahon and Stone Cold become uh, friends. And they work together to defeat The Rock and become world champion one more time. Going into this, again, just like Macho and Warrior, just like all the rest, 
how are Austin and The Rock working together? Because just like I said before, there's only room for one big dog in the yard, and Austin and Rock both want to be that dog. Well, if if, if you look at those two guys, they they're looking at the long picture, you know, and it's a it's a money making thing, and nobody wants to destroy nobody, but if you look at it visually, a storyline down the road, if it's, it's going to make both of them a hell of a lot of money. So why screw it up? Why be greedy? And, you know, it's like I'm saying, both of them went, went with the program. And now, now, do you feel like it was the right decision to turn Stone Cold Steve Austin, a beloved baby face, uh, heel at the end of this match to join up with Vince McMahon? Uh... I guess it's one of the questions is damn if you do or damn if you don't. You know what I mean? I think it was a bad decision. <laughs> uh, well, I, you, you know, I kind of think that way too. But uh, you you never know what they got planned for down the road. True, true. I don't know. Turning him uh, heel didn't really hurt anything because hell it, it, it's been so long ago and he's he's still over right now so other than you mentioning it and some people watching it who really knows yeah and uh, also that's when WCW and ECW just closed down so really whatever happened the only thing you had to watch was WWE so right right we did get Stone Cold Steve Austin singing with a guitar with Vince and Kurt Angle wearing funny hats and doing all those oh, yeah. hilarious bits backstage so I guess we got that out of all this, so we you know, right. some bad matches, but we got some entertaining quality backstage segments, though. In this amazing book, though, there are some stories, and one of them really was interesting because I have interviewed many wrestlers, and they have shared their experience with Mr. Fuji, the ribs. And one story, uh, I guess, leaked out on me was, you're hanging out with Mr. Fuji, and he decides just to pee on you for fun. What? Is that a common thing of Mr. Fuji of, hey, let's hang out tonight, and he pees on you? That's, that's uh, Mr. Fuji rib. We get rub in the business. You know, we had a bar, and he had to go to the bathroom, and he didn't do it intentionally, but all of a sudden I feel all this damn water or pee, and I'm going, what the hell is going on here? I said, Mr. Fuji. He goes, ha, 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 ha. Mr. Fuji teaching you something. What was the lesson? That if you gotta go, don't go. Just go where you're at. Oh man, do you have any other Fuji ribs that you could share possibly with us? Because I have heard some ones that probably aren't legal to share, but I've also heard ones that are like, oh, it's funny. Well, did you ever hear the one where he invited a bunch of guys over for dinner? No. He made a big pot of rice and put the uh, Perita dog food in it. Oh my. That and, and big laugh. Of course, they probably didn't eat all of it, but once they started eating it, he, you know, he goes, ah, ha, ha, I got you, I got you. Yeah, I've heard some stories of him. Uh, people would see, say, if Mr. Fuji buys you food, don't eat it. If Mr. Fuji does anything for you out of the kindness of his heart, don't take it, don't react, don't do anything because it's obviously going to be a rib. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's going to be dangerous on the road as a, even a referee because if you're traveling on these buses long distance, you want, you're tired, you want to take a, a nap. Are you figuring out a way to protect yourself? I know I talked to Mike Kyoto and he'd wear a hat and sunglasses. So if someone tried to do something to him, they have to take the hat and the glasses off first and he would feel that and then wake up and protect himself. What was your situation like? Did you have like some sort of mechanism to protect yourself? I didn't sleep at all on the buses. Nothing. I very seldom. I was probably drinking... And staying awake because, uh, I mean, like if you had a beer, somebody put a house on in it. Next thing you know, you sleep. When you wake up, your head shaved or your eyebrows are gone or God knows, uh, half your clothes are cut off of you. Uh, and, you know, that, that was mainly the bulldog. Oh, man. Speaking of the bulldogs, there's one very famous story where I've interviewed Jacques and Raymond about this where... 
Jacques and Dynamite Kid got into a backstage uh, altercation where fists were flown and teeth were knocked out. And I've heard many sto- uh, different angles of this story. Well, what's they- your... All right. So what's your angle of the story? Because it seems like Dynamite... And now, this is what I'm being told by the people. Dynamite's pushing around his weight. Well, Jacques and Raymond said, well, we can't let this happen. We can't let disrespect on our name. And, and so they did. They went right back and eventually attacked Dynamite. Jacques did. And from that point on, Raymond and Jacques were like protecting themselves. If one took a shower, one would protect themselves. So you were there. What's your experience like? And whose fault really is this? Well... They kept messing with the Rujos, okay? And it, 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 for a while it was okay, but after a while it, it got old. And Jock had just had enough of it. And it was at a TV in the, uh, where the hell was it? Uh, I forgot where it was. But it was at a TV and they had just eaten and they were joking about. Uh, they were ribbing Jock and all this stuff, and and it was dynamite. Not not so much of a book, uh, baby boy. So they got up and left catering, and um, dynamite came in the hallway and he went around the corner and Jock shot the lady right into it, knocked all his teeth out and everything. And so you're and in you're in the room while this punch happens in the hallway. From catering, we we're going back to the dressing rooms, and he he let he let it out right at the they were going down the hallway to the dressing room. So, I talked to Raymond, and then my kid hung out with Ultimate Warrior and other Jim Powers, other um, large individuals. And Jacques and Raymond were like, "We have to. This is this is Raymond's story. We have to. If we're gonna get a receipt on him, we have to do it when his friends aren't around because it will it will just turn sideways on the Rougeos." So Raymond shares a story where he's in the hallway with Pat Patterson talking and he sees all of the wrestlers leave Warrior and Jim Power. Everyone leaves the the locker room where Dynamite is and Jock just looks at Raymond and he goes, I'm going to do it now. And he just goes in there and that's when it happened. So you're in the hallway with Raymond there and Pat Patterson is there because, of course, you know, so many uh, stories have come out of this. So. What did you see? Did you see Warrior and all these guys leave the locker room and that was Jacques taking his opportunity? Well, you, you know, uh, there's two stories in this. Okay. Okay, the first one, they hit Jock and his jaw was swollen up. And they'd run around and say it, it was looked like he's chewing a red man. They'd make a big joke out of it because his jaw was popped up. That, that happened in the dressing room. The other one happened in the hallway going from catering to the dressing room Gee. when Jock unloaded on uh, Dynamite. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, according to Jacques and uh, Raymond, he uh, Jacques had a roll of quarters in his hand right. when when he punched him. Right. And, uh, and of course, Vince McMahon sat both teams down and was like, we can't have this. We cannot do this. And a few months later, the Bulldogs end up leaving the WWF and Raymond believes it's because of embarrassment. Uh, why do you feel the Bulldogs left? And, and of course, were there any more backstage scuffles after this once the Bulldogs were gone? Because the rumor is... This is all Mr. Perfect's fault. Apparently, he set up some rib and it went sideways and everyone got blamed the wrong way. I think, uh, well, the Bulldogs were always big rivers, you know? And I, I'm, I'm I'm assuming after all this happened, well, they figured out, they, no, nobody's going to keep putting up with this shit. So they they were out of business and had nobody to, to rib or mess with because they figured they'd get their butts kicked. Makes sense. But like they never, it never popped up in WCW. They went to, I know they went to Australia and went on tours across the world, but they never were back in the WWE. David Boy Smith eventually came back, but Dynamite never did for, you know, who knows what reason. I, I didn't, I wasn't quite in there. Well, I think, I think Dynamite was having health problems <laughs> back then after they left, you know, and, uh, I think Bob getting their ass kicked, it, it kind of embarrassed them. Yeah, I, I imagine. When you're known as being a bully and the aura around you is you are a right. tough guy, well, once you get knocked out by one punch, a couple punches, but you guess he's holding quarters, that aura is gone. And that same thing happened to um, Vader in the WCW. Paul Orndorff punched him in the face, knocked him out, and and then suddenly the aura of 
the big bad grizzly Vader was gone because of, you know, that. But there's so many backstage things have happened, and obviously you've been there. One of the biggest ones is, according to rumors, Nails, who was the rival of the big boss man in 1992, attacked Vince McMahon over a payment at SummerSlam. I was, now, I was right there and saw it all in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So Nails did physically touch and choke and hurt Vince McMahon? He had Vince McMahon up against the wall like a chicken going down the Purdue chicken line. And if it hadn't been for Slaughter being in there or close by, he would have messed Vince up. But it was over a payday. They paid boss man more than they paid uh, Nails. And Nails found out. And they were tag team partners. And Nails... The rooms were down in the basement. He come down the steps, and he went into Vince's office, and all I could hear was screaming and hollering. And I looked in there, and he had Vince right here up against the wall. He said, "I want my money." He said, "More than that, but I'm making it polite." Of course, I'm money. You f me, and I'll work. You paid him this. I deserve that. That's when uh. After that, then Vince always had an uh, agent in his room with him. He, he was never left alone, or he had him at the door. Wow. So, previous to this, do you know of any other wrestlers who got their hands on Vince in the manner that Nails did? No, no not really. It's probably a five hundred of them wish they could have, but Nails was the only one that got him. Wow. And, you know... When Nails went to go be a part of the steroid trial, he pretty much lost the case, unfortunately, by saying, not lost the case, it wasn't obviously him, but he said, you know, I hate Vince McMahon, I hate Vince McMahon, so that probably didn't help the case of, you know, hey, we're trying to create a case here. But the fact that you were there, and you, so you open the door, and you see Vince McMahon getting choked out, what do you think? Do you think, maybe I should do something, or maybe I should just close this door and back away? Well, I wish nobody, I wish Slaughter had never went in there to save him. I would love to see him whoop his ass. The, well, you know, you, I guess, again, you physically saw Nails holding Vince McMahon by the throat, choking him. Is he purple? Is he pink? Like, what, what, what demeanor? Obviously, when you're being choked, something's going on, but is there being, are you being held against the wall or are you being choked against the wall? Being choked against the wall. I mean, just a flat boom. Oh, my God. Over a SummerSlam payday uh, between, between the big boss man and Nails. So what a great storyline. But obviously, that story in, about Nails has been told forever. And really, it's very hard to find someone who was actually, like, in the hallway or, opened the, or who opened the door or in the room. The fact that you were there, that, you know, my God, you're, you're again, folks, if you need more stories like that, Check out this book. There's probably more people getting peed on in this book by Mr. Fuji. <laughs> hey, like my book. I'm at the right place at the right time. That's right. Who doesn't want to get peed on by Mr. Fuji? You can, uh, you know, if you were, if you weren't, it wouldn't be in a book. Right. You wouldn't be selling it. All, all, these, all these great things that have happened to you. Though there are moments of tragedy in professional wrestling. And one, you're in the ring. When Stone Cold Steve Austin gets dropped on his head by Owen Hart at SummerSlam 1997. This is a moment that could have changed wrestling forever because Steve Austin was on the rise. WCW was kicking the crap out of the WWE in ratings. Austin was the white horse, the, the stallion, the knight that was going to save everybody. Dropped on his head. Can't feel his legs. Can't feel his hands. What are you doing in the ring? Well, uh, after that bump, I thought... Austin looked at me, he goes, Hebner, Earl, I think my neck's broke. I go, well, stay right there. So I'm giving Owen, ba 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 ba. I said, his neck's broke, I think, making emotion and everything. And I said, just back up and back over him and let him roll you up. Let me count to three so we can get him out of here. And that's what we did. So, I, did I, you know, I didn't want him to pick him up or slam him on, the, don't even touch him. Just roll back up and let him schoolboy you real quick, and 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 let's get out because he's hurt, you know. And, 
and Owen is obviously speaking to you as well. You can tell he's kind of looking at you, gesturing yeah. to you, pointing at him. What is Owen saying to you? I, oh, he said, oh, no, he, it was just that spur of the moment. He goes, okay, okay. I said, Owen, please, get back right up, trip over him, let him roll you up, and, and don't kick out. Let me count one, two, three, so we can get the hell out of here because he's hurt. He said, okay, okay, gotcha. And you made that call? Yeah. This is before the IFB in your ER days, right? Right. So if no one knows, yeah. later on, referees had IFBs in their ear so people could communicate with them. Right, right. So, but, uh, now, you know, before, I mean, it's, it's the same call, but if somebody's hurt, you just put the X up. You know, and that before the IBF and everything else. And if he's okay, then you just you, you just do this. As uh, long as you get the right arm up or left arm, that's a sign of uh, he's okay, you know. And so after this matchup, when you're talking to the agents or even Vince McMahon, are they talking to you saying, hey, man, right call, or hey, what what made you do this? Like Because, again, no one knows what's going on because it, it's laid on head, oh, my God, Austin can't move, Owen's gesturing to you, then you make this call saying, let's just, let's just go home, wrap it up. And great call, obviously, because, you know, he was hurt. But he's carried out of the ring. But is anyone talking to you after this going, hey, what made you – say this or do this because it was a kiss my ass match if no one knows if steve austin lost he actually had to kiss owen hart's ass that was the stipulation on television but is anyone talking to you about the ending no 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 yeah but it, you know through the years starting and where i ended up it i got smarter and working with the guys and knowing their moves and how they fall and how they land it's a, I was just very, I don't know, worried about everybody, including myself, but always worried about, I could always tell basically when somebody's hurt. Mm. And that's what a lot of these referees uh, uh, have to do now is as long as they're in the business and they keep working with these guys, keep watching them, how they do it, what they do, and and you can tell, you know, it's not uh, uh, it's not that you can't learn. Uh, you can tell where something's not right, you know. Hell, I even bump through the ropes the way you land on the floor, you know. Nothing worked perfect in this business. That's why people get hurt. Right. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, Owen Hart, he passed away in the ring as well. I know you weren't the referee in the ring at that time. It was um, not Mike Yoda. It was, was it? Jimmy Caderas. Yes, Jimmy Caderas. Caderas. And I talked to him about this, and he felt Owen rush by him while he was in the ring because before that was a hardcore match where he's brushing out the dirt that's in the ring. And how do you feel about this night? Because so many people still to this day believe someone dies in the ring you shouldn't continue a show, ever. Not even a thought of, in, in today's world, it seems so easy to go, why would you do that? But in 1999, apparently, it was, on with the show, that's what Owen would want. I don't think that's the case at all, but how do you feel about that? A man dies in the ring, and they have two more matches after this. Maybe three. Okay, I, I might be wrong on this, but uh, when that uh, Buffalo Bills uh, football player got hurt, didn't they stop the game and do away with it? Yeah, that would be the first time I think in NFL history that a uh, that happened. Okay. Anytime there's a death in any sport, I think it should be stopped and cut off. There's always tomorrow. You can always go back tomorrow. If you had a big thunderstorm, power allergies, you wouldn't have the show, right? Yep. Okay. So what's the big deal? You lost man lost his life, and you still going to have the show. It makes sense. No. I agree. It, it's horrible. It's called um, money. Right. And, you know, this is in the, heart, uh, the height of the Attitude Era, so obviously money is flowing in. So the idea of having to get refunds, I guess. Well, you wouldn't have had to. The same people who are there then would come back tomorrow. You wouldn't have lost your money you just had to do it a different day. I can imagine, though, that unfortunately cost effect, not cost effective to you traveling to another town for money. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is right, 
But I'm saying you have to travel to the next town for Raw. Well, you got to get in the car and go to the next spot. Renting out an arena costs money. There are contracts. So I understand from a financial point, you're kind of go, well, well, we're going to lose a lot of money if we do this. But at the same time, someone died. And you've made a lot of money, uh, not just on him, but his brother and his family and all the wrestlers who put in hours of work away from their families. Exactly. Maybe, maybe it's a good idea to maybe, you know, stop the show. I would have. I, I hated it that they kept, that they went on and done it. I mean, even the guys were upset. And, you know, we're losing one of your fellows of talent. And then it affects the whole show for the rest of the night. I mean, nobody could really, nobody had that really filled up and to go out there and do 100%. There's no way. And it showed. Yeah. I also, I'm very, you know, glad that in that time there was no cell phones with uh, cameras on them because that video, unfortunately, of Owen passing away would have been shared everywhere and it would have been disgusting oh, yeah. to see. Oh, yeah. So I mean, I was right there to monitor the grill position, okay, when it all happened. And the agents and everybody ran out. Maybe a couple other referees ran out. And I didn't run out. I stayed right there. I was in shock, for one thing. And I didn't want to be in the way of if people needed to get to him and get air or whatever it may be, you know. And But when they brought him back through, uh, he, he, he was purple as purple can be. So I was thinking right then he, he, he was gone. But from what I understand, when he hit the rope, it tore his main artery out. That's what I was told. I'm just quoting that. And that's what probably put the end of the whole deal for it. So when you see this, when Owen Hart comes through Gorilla, Vince McMahon is obviously there. What is Vince McMahon doing? Is he sitting there with a pad of paper, writing things down? Is he talking to everyone? Is he making decisions on the fly? What is his demeanor? He sat right there where he was. When it all happened, he saw it, and he never moved. He stayed right there. And when they brought on through the gorilla, he was in that same chair. He never stood up. He might have stood up, I can't remember, but he never made a made a way to to get closer. Mm -hmm. Like we like everybody else was. Right. Yeah. Um, I've heard stories, is if it's true or not, since you were there, The Rock was I believe um near Owen and try, trying to get inside of the uh ambulance that Owen was in. I, I don't know if it was the rock. I believe there's another individual who they were all like, we need to get inside of this ambulance. They wanted to go to the hospital. It, do you know who went to the hospital the Owen or who was trying to get inside the ambulance? I really don't know because once they brought him through, I, I just, you know, stayed where I was. And because I, it's not that I didn't care, but I, I, I just didn't want to see all, all of it, you know? I was already upset and along with everybody else being there, but I just didn't want to follow the, the leader, you know? Right. And then are you state, so the next a half an hour, 40 minutes goes by, you're, are you still in Gorilla watching as the broadcast is continuing on and as everyone's trying to act like nothing has happened? Yep. Yep. And it kicks in. Uh, JR was saying, uh, once we get an update on, on, on our world, we'll let you know, we'll let you know, you know, and everything. Yeah. JR yeah. said out of nowhere, he was just told, all right, uh, we're coming back in five. And all, also, Owen Hart has passed away. Three, two, one. Here, Here we go. go. Like that, that's some brutal news to hear about one of your colleagues. Not what you want to call it, one of your friends passing away. And now you're up on TV. Three, two, one, go. Right. Hey, Ed. Yeah, I I I agree. You know that was an, I know that was a long time ago, but still, it's still a a touchy subject for wrestling fans, for people obviously involved as well. And you know, with with Owen Hart though, there's always great stories about Owen Hart because you always heard he was also a ribber. 
He would prank yeah. all people using Stu Hart's voice. Did you ever get ribbed by Owen? A, a, a nice rib. Not a Mr. Fuji peeing on you rib or feeding dog food to your rib. A nice rib. No, Owen never ribbed me, but I'll watch him rib everybody else. <laughs> Let me say this. That year, when Owen passed away, he was building a, a brand new house. And he had told me, and probably a lot of other people, that at the end of that year, he was going to retire and go home with his family because of the new house he built. And, I mean, I'm sure other people know that as well as I do, but it's not like he made a microphone check and said, hey, I after this year, I'm leaving, going home or retire. But he told me that. Man, no, Owen was such a great guy. And, you know, I don't think we talked about it before. What was Owen Hart's uh, feelings towards you after the Montreal screw job? Because he disappears off TV for maybe a month. And then he comes back and the rumor is he got a raise. He got more money. Um, but Bulldog and Anvil ended up leaving. They wanted another contract. They went to WCW. That didn't really work out for them at all. Owen stayed. And, you know, we talked about what happened to him, unfortunately. And that was an accident. But what? how did Owen feel towards you after all this? If you just understand you're a company man doing what you're asked by your boss? I, Owen truthfully came up to me and said, I want you to know something. I'm not mad at you. I have no hard feelings about what happened. He said, I just want you, and that's what he told me personally. As I'm looking at you, talking to you, he said, I'm not mad at you. And we're still friends. I understand. And that was about it. And I said, well, I really appreciate that. Good to hear. Because, you know, I've only heard good stories about Owen Hart from everybody. Owen was such a good, great guy, really. I mean, he, 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 he did a lot of ribs here and there. But down to heart, he was a big, hearty guy. He really was. That's good to hear. Because, you know, you, you always want... You, it's good to hear the own heart, all the good stories over the years. Because as a, as a child watching him, I hated him. I was like, you're a bad guy. How dare you hurt your big brother, Brett? But, you know, when you grow up, you realize, wait a minute. Bruh. So good. He might even be better than Brett because of his promos and his in-ring skills and the way yeah. he could... Bump around the ring. He was he was incredible. I always I always will love Owen Hart. We're a channel. Oh my God, unbelievable! You know, talking about Bret Hart for a second. And by the way, more stories about Bret Hart and you inside this book. If you want to hear everything about Montreal Screw Job, which we discussed previously in our other interview. But WrestleMania Nine, you're the referee. Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's Bret Hart versus Yokozuna. And one of my favorite things is the crowd's chanting USA. Well, guess what? Yoko's supposed to be from Japan. Brett's from Canada. I don't understand that yet. But uh, y Yoko wins. Hogan shows up. He beats Yoko. What are the boys feeling about this moment? Because Hogan's been gone for about a year now. Since WrestleMania 8 to 9. He comes up. Boom. He's world champion. You're in the ring. You, you, how are you feeling about all this? Are the boys talking to you going, oh, this is bullshit? Well... You know, like, Yoko was a business man, and you know, Hogan's a hero, okay, regardless. I mean, look, at, before Yoko got here, uh, look uh, what Yoko did, the undertaking him had a hell of a, a storyline going for a long time, and uh, uh, I know it's bullshit, but it's business, yeah. you know? And you're trying to put butts in seats and Hogan was your vitamin kid, vitamin man, and this and that. And it was it was a money-making deal. And he's, you know, even, even it, it, like I said, it was bullshit, but, but nevertheless, uh, you got to pay the bills, you got to pay the boys, so, uh, go, you know, and, you know, Yoku understood that as money making i'm sure yoko made a lot of money uh by dropping the strap and, and whatever he did but but uh it's all dollar signs brother all dollar signs and uh, you know the million dollar man always says everyone's got a price and uh you know there's a there's a price there hogan though shows up to this event with a black eye and boy 
we didn't have the internet then, but when it started appearing, everyone had these rumors that Macho Man punched Hogan in the face over what happened with Liz years ago, a jet ski accident. What is that black guy all about? What did you hear about this black guy? I didn't hear a whole lot about it because, um, truthfully, I didn't really care about it, you know? And I just know that he had a black eye, but it wasn't nothing to me, you know what I mean? As long as I didn't have a black eye, I didn't give anybody else to have a black eye. <laughs> That's true. If that guy has a black eye, well, I don't have one, so I'm okay. I'll tell you what I did do. Uh, what's that ship in New York? A uh, boat, uh, it's a ship where they flew Yoko's, I mean, uh, they Oh, the, intre the Intrepid? The Intrepid. I, now, I referee that match. Oh, with Yoko and uh, uh, Lex Luger. Now, when the, I when the picked uh, Yoko up and slammed him. Now, I've heard stories about this. Let's talk about it for a second. How hot was it on that boat? It's July 4th, 1993, and Bruce Pritchard said his shoes were melting into the cement on the ship. So, how hot was this? I'm going to tell you what. I went here with Yoko, and, you know, Yoko was barefooted. And he looks, he steps on the man, and he goes, Damn, baby, we're all as hot as shit over here. And... But, and after it was all said and done, when he got back to the dressing room, he had blisters on his feet. But right, and it was hot. I mean, it was, that was probably one of the hottest days I've ever seen in my whole life. And Yoko's feet had blisters on Oh, man. Uh, you know, great idea for a uh, situation of a nice moment to crown Lex Luger as the new USA Hulk Hogan or the WWE, but... I've all heard stories about was, well, what a great event, but yeah, it was friggin' hot as hell. Uh, yep, and, yeah. and like, Macho Man is in full, he's got a hat on, he's got his pants on, he's got a jacket on. Like, do you know the temperature? Because again, if, if someone's feet are blistering up, if someone's shoes are melting into cement, that means it's a bit hot. Look, Randy wore his outfit through airports. Really? Yeah. The whole deal. The whole deal. So, okay. So, and not one of the stupidest thing in the world. Yeah. But it's a plus. To me, that's fun. Like, oh, that's cool. But yet, if you're trying to get from one destination to another through the airport, and you're a wrestler that's well known, like, to man, you know, put on a hood. Put it over your head, put some sunglasses on, you get through. He's wearing a bright ass United States, USA, red, white, and blue bodysuit, and he's trying to get his bags. He's not, he doesn't expect someone's gonna ask for an autograph. Well, that's what I'm saying. He, he always got pissed off because people would come up to me, to him. But what do you expect when you're dressed in your gimmick and you got marks at the airport, know you're coming in anyway, not just one person, but they know everybody's gotta come there for the show. So, Airports all with marks, and they see Macho Man dressed up in his his costume, and what the hell? Of course they're gonna run me. That's amazing to hear, though. Now, here's a question for you: Do you, now you don't have to say names, but if you unless you want to. Um, for years we've had wrestling rumors or storylines spill out into dirt sheets in the internet. Did you ever know or? Hear of someone you knew being feeding these creative storylines to say Dave Meltzer or other outlets because it seems like no matter what movies, music, anything that that stuff always spills out. Well, the rest of like it feels like it just flows out sometimes. Did you know anyone who was doing this, and do you get paid to give the dirt? Uh, well, it's like uh. You know, like uh, what when they say somebody's got injured their neck, right? So the next thing you know, you come to TV and you got a neck brace on. Well, if you don't wear the neck brace to the airports traveling, what the hell's the big big deal of of a promoting that your neck's hurt if it's not hurt? Why do you travel? You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but. It's also a television program where if I broke my leg in a movie, I wouldn't walk through the airport with a cast on because I'm 
I am playing a part. And he, obviously wrestling is real when you're getting slammed down, but it is predetermined. So if you break your neck, if you really broke your neck and you're wearing your cast, sure. But if you broke your neck on television and you're not, like, at the time, people have come forward. Crockett and Vince McMahon went to to many different uh, territories and saying wrestling is a show. This is not an athletic competition. And so, but did you know people who were just feeding the internet in dirt sheets of, hey, I know this great storyline is coming. Let me tell you. Well, you know what? That's like right now. People know who's going to win WrestleMania. It's already out. And the hand gets out is the people working in the business. It doesn't get it out by the marks because somebody's got to tell them. They're not sitting in those production meetings, an agent's meeting. It's, it's, it's the agents and the, and, 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 and the production crew. And you may have a Mark production guy. And, I mean, you know, they go, uh, they go and say, hey, hey, uh, 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 Macho Man's going over tonight. Um, Flair's going over tonight. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but why do you think they do that? Because they're stupid. They're just outright stupid and sh- the asses should be fired. I, yeah. I, I wish... I wish that there was a scenario, I've always wondered this as a child or even an adult, is if you tell four people a story but tell them different endings, see what story gets out on the internet, and you'll figure out who is your mole. Right. By me, maybe they ask. Yeah. The story of me and my brother, the twins, look alike. How many people knew about that? Zero. Right. Right. And that's the most kayfabe thing probably now in the history of this business because there's no such thing as kayfabe anymore. You know? yeah. And and we did that mostly at nighttime. Nobody was seen together. It was all different colors carrying dusts of different places. We practiced at nighttime in the warehouse. Nobody was there but Vince, the, the people involved in it. And we didn't have nothing. When when I went into the building, everybody thought I was David. I went right to Bears' office and stayed there all day till time to go to that ring. Nobody ever saw me, ever knew. And when David came in, actually people really never, didn't realize that it was two of us because they only saw one of us at a time. It's brilliant. And that's what made that thing so meaningful. Mean, meaning, meaningful. Yeah. That nobody knew what the hell was going on except the people involved. I don't and uh, maybe you're aware of this too, but there is still a group of people who believe that Survivor Series 1997 is a work. You, Sean, Brent, and Vince all got together and plotted this amazing plan that it would last until, you know, thirty years later. People still believe that. And you know, each person has come forward. You have Brett, Sean, Vince. You know, they all shared their piece and what they feel. How do you feel about that? When people believe that what you did and what happened that day is not real. It was part of a storyline that's been going on for 25 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can only, you can't make people believe something that they don't want to believe. No matter how, how many times you tell them. Or what you, the answer you give them, that's why uh, I said, well, I don't know for sure. That way they don't get an answer. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Yeah. All the yeah. book and the book of tape. And I say, yeah, if, if you guys wanted the full stir of the Montreal Screw Job, it is inside this book. Well, I don't blame you. No. What? what? Yeah. <laughs> no. Sable, Sable did what? Yeah, now you can, if you want to know, you can pay for it. <laughs> yeah, you got to, because we're not going to give it away here, because, again, it, that is such a, a monumental moment for professional wrestling. We're still talking about today in this world. You know, with WCW being such a big part of the wrestling business in the 90s, and Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan and Hogan Savage leaving for WCW from WWF, was there ever discussion having you the main event referee of the WWF leave to go to WCW. Well, I did 
we did, my brother and I had a deal to go if we wanted to. What year is this? Gosh. Right after, basically, everybody started going down there within about a year. Okay. It's like 95, 96. Yeah. But the thing was is that before the events went public, it, it was like a family uh, company. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I was so, my brother and I was so loyal to Vin that we turned the deal down. Because we went into Vince's office and he, somebody had let it out, out the bag. So we went in there, said our events, and he said, he still pad on the paper, uh, he threw a pad on the table. He said, you tell, hey, write down what you want. I'll be back in a little, little while. What do you want to make? And we told him, and with no, it was okay. You got it. I told my brother, hell, we should have wrote more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, is that the worst? Because if you wrote like a crazy amount of money, he'd be like, nah, I'm good. But yeah, but you wrote too low. He'd be like, "That's fine with me. Sure, sure, whatever." It was, I mean, he was such a good guy back then, and so low, and we were too, and a lot of people working there were, uh, were low, you yeah. know. But after a while, it got, it got, a, it, like I say, when they when they went corporate, it 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 was it, it went downhill, for his feelings and and loving somebody and treating somebody it was a total disaster. It was all about money then. Right. You're suddenly talking to the stockholders versus talking to your uh, referees and backstage correspondents. So, yeah, I was always surprised that there was never some sort of like referee jump because it's like Nash, Hall, you know, like I said, Savage, uh, Mean Gene, Bobby Heenan, uh, everyone it seemed like was jumping. And then as you were a man of a referee, the fact that Vince McMahon believes in you so much that he looked down a pad of paper like you do, you write down what you want. And we'll talk later. And obviously, he was uh, on board with you because he paid whatever that amount was, correct? I don't think he ever looked at it. He just picked it up and walked off. Wow. Wow. And now, does anyone, because I don't do it, you know, at, at work when you're with your other employees, I don't go around saying, hey, I make this amount of money and you make that amount of money. Does anyone actually know what a referee makes at this point in time? Not really, because everybody makes different. Okay. Everybody, I mean, like the guys just coming in, they probably get a good salary. Okay. But as they keep going and keep going, and they keep giving them this, that, and the other, and they do a good job, then they pay them more. It's just like any other job, but normal job you get, the better you get, the more you're going to make. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, you know, we talked about WrestleMania a bunch, and WrestleMania Six is one of those main events you're also involved with, also Warrior and Hulk Hogan, two huge personalities. Like the other main events that you've been a part of, it seems like two giant clashing personalities where Hogan is actually going to lose cleanly on TV, on pay-per-view, to the Ultimate Warrior, unlike the double referee situation where he lost the belt because of uh, you know, the plastic surgery, how much did it cost? But how is that? situation in backstage building to this matchup because again Hogan's about to lose for the first time in a very long time maybe half a decade to Ultra Warrior who's going to be the new face of the company well I guess it was I mean you can't have a champion for, for 20 years the same champion you know what I mean and you look at these guys coming into business today uh, some are really, really talented big time and take some other ones time to get built up. And it's like the same food. You don't eat the same thing every day. So when it comes to, you got to make a new foundation somewhere along the line. So it's when it's time to make that choice and you see, you see, last time we were here, we had 20,000. This time we got 15. And then you go back again. Last time we were here, we had 15. Now we're down to 10. It's like anything else, it gets old. 
Yeah. So, you know, I mean, look at these new champions all in all of the organizations now. You know, I mean, hell, they're switching belts like uh, stoplights at corners now. Uh, yeah, it depends which championship you're talking about, but there are some champions who've had it for years now and almost right. over a year right. breaking records. But with Warrior, though, when he won the championship, he had no contenders because it seemed like they didn't build anyone up for him once he became champion. Hogan destroyed everybody he could, and I don't know if that was a, a, a smart move on his or because when Warrior gets the belt, business goes down. Is it because of the Warrior being champion? Is because you business is going down in general? Like, there's no way to pinpoint that, but Hogan can obviously use that as, well, look at that happen. I went away, and you made made less money. I'm the guy, right? And it happened a couple times with Macho Man in Warriors Champions. So, how do you, are you talking to Hulk Hogan or talking to people who are friends with him, realizing, like, Hogan, he's going away to make a movie. He's going to get back, and when the minute he gets back, he's getting back his championship. Well, it's like you said, you put the belt on this guy, that guy, and the other guy, and they're not drawing. So when you come back, it's all new again. So he's been gone. And then the, nine times out of ten, a lot of fans missed him. Told him to put the strap back on him. Business goes up again. Yeah. Again, he had a different whole gimmick of how he did things and what he did, how he done them, and had have people believed in him and everything. They just loved it, you know. Did the backstage uh, producers and the company employees all with Hogan believe in him when Warrior became champion? Did they go, "Oh, we don't believe in you"? Like, how? Like, is there a demeanor towards your champion? Like, are they feeling good about Warrior or not good about it? That at all? Not good at all. A warrior, because you give you you gave it to a madman. You know, they you gave it to a guy that didn't 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 give a shit if he clothed on you and twist your neck or if he, whatever he did to you, he was never protecting you. And, you know, the boys, you know, say, oh, this is BS, man. You know, when you're a world champion, you know you're going over, but you don't have to beat the hell out of somebody and, and bruise them all up because they got to work the next day. But he, he just never did any of the clotheslines and all the stuff so brutal. So let me ask you a question about ravaging Rick Rude because he has to work with Warrior after this, and the story goes that Warrior actually kind of not beat him up, but attacked him backstage to make sure, like, listen, you're out there beating the crap out of me, so you better stop that right now because I can beat the crap out of you back here. Is that any, any of that true? I was in uh, Savannah, Georgia. We had a house show, and then we had a pay-per-view the next day. The Warrior cut a promo on Rude and Rude was at the billing, and she the warrior got there. Rude started telling me this, that, and the other, and the, and, the, and uh, the warrior got out of hand with his mouth, and Rude beat the shit out of him right there in the billing, beat him around the ring, down the stretch, through the limo, and he was screaming, Earl, get him off me, Earl, get him off me. And that was when they were in a pay-per-view together. But Rude was a bad, bad guy. I mean, a tough guy. Not a bad, and he'd kick your ass, and that's what he did to the Warrior. Because SummerSlam 1990, they have a steel cage match for the World Championship that night. Warrior retains against Rick Rude, but you're telling me before this matchup, Rick Rude beat the crap on Elton Warrior in front of the audience, through the aisle away, backstage in the parking lot. No, no, this is at the nobody was there at the building. Oh, no, wow. But we were getting. Ready to whatever go over it or something, and they and uh, Rude told me he didn't appreciate what he said or whatever. And I don't, I don't. It's been so long ago, but uh, Rude knocked the hell out of him, and then he started running for it around the building. <laughs> well, he right. could run. He, he he could run fast. We've seen that. Yeah. Right. So, wow. 
uh, again, I, as I can't uh, stress enough, this book, it has so many more stories than what we're sharing here today. There's just so many. I have a couple more questions and then we'll go so I can read this again. I don't know. It's 45 years worth, worth of goodness in there. God, let me go. What? <laughs> no. No, I, 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 it's funny because I stumbled upon Twin Magic is like the, the, I opened this page and I lit it on Twin Magic. But there's a, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, there's a chapter, uh, a section dedicated to J.T. Snake Roberts. And, and he's one of those characters who I've heard many stories about where he'd keep a snake inside of the trunk while driving. And well, that snake would die because it was so damn cold out. But yet, the most famous for me is Jake the Snake has a King Cobra in the ring, and he allows it to mow down on the Macho Man's arm. And again, this is airing at like 10 in the morning in my area where I'm a little kid watching this, seeing a snake eat Macho Man alive. Now, I know you're not probably out there, but what is that situation like? Because this is not a trained animal that you can go, okay, stop biting him, cut. This animal won't let go. And I've interviewed Jake about this twice now. And Jake's like, I am shaking this thing. I am trying to get it off him. And it will not come off. Yeah. What is the demeanor backstage? It, what the demeanor is, once Jake got into the uh, building and like if it was cold weather and you put him in the shower and turn the water on to warm him up so he could move, work, doing the show. And uh, everybody was scared to death of this man. You know, the, uh, the snake bit Andre and the snake broke broke his teeth in his arms, left his teeth print, or left his teeth in Andre's arm. Really? Yeah. And Andre stepped on the snake one night by accident and the, and the snake gets sh shit all over the ring. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's I'm not funny, you. but it's so funny. And you talk about something steep. And it was as yellow as a uh, caution light on the stop sign. And uh, smelt like hell. So there's a story about Jake where <clears throat> the snake has died on the way to the arena. And he's trying. So he has to go out the ring and do the whole bit where he throws a snake on him. And he throws a dead snake on somebody. And someone's like, um... The snake's not moving. Jake's like, yeah, just wiggle it around. Pretend it's getting, it's shedding you. Like, how many snakes do you think died in the care of Jake the Snake Roberts? Well, it's got to be, I really don't know, but it's been a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like in Canada, they would freeze. Right. You know, and even in the water time, like I said, when you curve around, they're, they're they're cold, so he had to put them in the shower, turn the water all warm, and loose them up so they can move. Dude. That King Cobra, though, biting Macho Man, Jake has said that Macho was like, I don't believe you. I don't believe that snake is venomized. So Jake took the snake and let him bite him in the ankle in front of Macho Man to prove you know, and so Macho Man apparently kept like laser eyes on him all day that he wasn't going to take like the venomized cure to get rid of it. Like, but Jake has said that before he let that King Cobra bite him, he slapped that King Cobra on the top of his head and then gave it to Macho Man's arm, which again, he latches in and bites him. <clears throat> so, you know, we've shared so many Macho Man stories, but what is Macho Man feeling about this when he gets backstage? Because I can't imagine he's happy. No, he's not happy at all. He's. Give you death, he's gonna die. Really? Is there a doctor nearby to take oh, care yeah, of this situation? For all the shows. You know, they, they they may travel have a traveling doctor now, but back then we always had a doctor at shows. Yeah, well, I would hope you have one of the King Cobras eating someone on live television. Uh, <laughs> Did you ever have a, a close encounter with that with one of those snakes? Because you get you're in the ring refereeing these matches. It's got to be a situation where you're like, shit, he's gonna get me with this thing. Brother, when he got this snake out the bag, all I was doing was looking for a place to hide, uh, to move, to get away from it. Man, I never trusted this snake. Truthfully, I well, I wouldn't trust Jake versus the snake, but uh, <laughs> you know, a bad bad man with a giant snake, I wouldn't cross him at all. Um, I have a couple more questions, though. One is, 
Royal Rumble. Royal Rumble is a thing everyone absolutely loves. They have pools, they pull numbers, they have fun. Is there a moment you remember being involved in the Royal Rumble where you're like, this did not go as planned because we have seen people go over at the same time planned. We've also seen people go over that was not planned. But have you ever been involved where you're like, this is going awry. Like, this is not going at all like we discussed. Well, there's a few, I mean, there's a few botches in, in all the matches, you know. But the only thing I can say is this, that I knew when Hogan picked me up and started running, that wasn't what we did. It was what we said we were going to do. I was going to just boom, like right here, get easy. And when he started running, I go, this ain't the plan. And when he shot me, uh, uh, uh. well, when he started running, I knew, I knew something all right. <laughs> yeah, that uh, we discussed that in our last interview. And boy, that involves the twin magic, which again is in this book where you can pick it up. Because there is so much in this book that we've discussed a little bit of, but we didn't discuss like the whole package of it all. And, you know, I have like maybe one more question for you. Demolition is a tag team that I think belongs to the Hall of Fame. They're not in the Hall of Fame right now. They held the streak for the longest title reign for like 20-something years until I think New Day and the Usos defeated that as well. Did you believe that Demolition was supposed to just be a Road Warriors Legion of Doom ripoff? No. 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 They, I mean, they were entirely different. You know, I mean, they had, I mean, look at the people that have paint on them now. You know, look at the uh, guy, I can't think of his name up there. I mean, even though half his face is painted, you can still say he's trying to rip off Sting, but he's not. It's just another gimmick. You know, and that, no, I, I don't think Demolition ever came in to be the second Royal Boy. They came in with their own gimmick, and and I don't think they were trying to rip nobody off. And I like, I think they belong in the Hall of Fame too. Big I agree. Time. Yeah, long time ago, not just now, a long time ago. Yeah, I'll be talking to Axe and Smash in a few months for a sit down interview, so I have many just many questions for them. But again. If you look at Demolition and even their outfits, they looked like what metal was being described as rock, you know, rock and roll metal. And mm -hmm. the leather and the hats and the masks versus Legion of Doom, who are clearly uh, Mad Max and looking like that. So I never thought they were a ripoff, but I, that question seems to be one of those questions that exists till the end of time. And so mm -hmm. someone with your expertise, I was like, I need to ask Earl. I need to figure out how he feels about this because to me, they weren't a ripoff. They were not. Let me look at your. Uh, uh, go back and, and people just look at look look at the uh, Road Warrior dress and look at demo dress right. and put them side by side and look. There's a big difference, you know. But it's uh, it's all in your head. Is what you think, you know? Yeah, because uh, uh, eventually the well, Legion of Doom does come to the WWF. And they immediately get a put in a program in demolition. And so that's really why I think where all this starts kicking in too is because, like, wait a minute. The the rumor people kept thinking they were a ripoff. But to me, demolition is my demolition. Like, I didn't watch as a child. I didn't have a chance to watch NWA or Crockett or anything like that because that was not in my area where I lived. The WWF was my bread and butter. So demolition was always mine. So when Legion of Doom came in, I was like, who are you and why do you look like the team I love? Right. Uh, the opposite of what people actually probably think in the wrestling world, but I, I'm so happy I got that answer from you because I love demolition. I love Legion of Doom. I love oh, Powers of Pain. So next time I'm on your, I'm on your show. I got a big, big picture. I mean, a pretty big one. I'll have it down here with, and we'll have all my books because I hope I'll be sold by the end. Oh yeah, they'll they'll be empty I'll off that table. A picture for you to see me, me and demolition. Oh, I cannot wait. And again, you have shared so many great WrestleMania stories today. Royal Rumbles, Nails. We've talked about so many amazing things today. And we've only, it was like a little pinch of what you can get from this amazing book by Earl Hebner. Again, folks, uh, let's hold on. No way. Early Road Stories. That's right, folks. There's probably some craziness in here. Some rock and roll, drugs and rock and roll. But Earl, I got to say, it is always a pleasure talking to you. And again, today, it has been an honor and a privilege. 
Do you have anything you'd like to share? I know you have your action figure there. You have your book. Anything else coming up? Uh, no, not really. This is about all I have right now. But these uh, these new action figures just come out from the asylum, and you can look on there. Uh, um, I'm tired of fake. Looking, looking pretty buff in those action figures too, by the way. Well, that's when I was young. <laughs> I was say, man, those are those are chisel muscles. You got a six pack underneath that shirt, right? Yeah, but there's uh the WWF, old WWF. Oh yeah, Murphy shirt and this one, and then that was today's shirt and this one. What did you prefer to wear, the bow tie or the stripes? Right, yeah. So you you got a chance to get both of them, but you can uh, look on the website for the asylum and uh, they can fix you right up. Amazing. I get some uh, out, so bring them to the house shows or signs that I'm at. Oh man. I, I, I hope the world gets to sit down and meet Earl Heaven, the GOAT of professional wrestling referees, because, again, it's been an honor and a privilege talking about the past, the present, the future. I got to go online right now and buy one of those. So while I play with my action figures, I'm going to say when I play with myself, and uh, read your book at the same time. <laughs> then you get that one, too. See, folks. See, folks, he was holding out on us. He said all he had was this one action figure and that one book. Then he pops out another action figure. Hey, I think can it... do everything. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to know everything, that's what you got to get right there. Very good, folks. Again, Earl Hubbard, the official story. And the author, too, has written so many other amazing books. But first, you got to buy the Earl Hebner one. Oh, folks, you got quick hands. Still got quick hands. <laughs> Earl, thank you so much for being here on Ten Count Wrestling News Co. I've been Steve Fall. He's the GOAT, Earl Hebner. Have a great day, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.